so before we get started, I uh, just want to let you know that I have a, a really exciting new offering coming, uh, and it's a Asana Kitchen subscription channel. So it's uh, going to have um, new content once per week, um, kind of video, uh, short forms, Ashtanga short forms, uh, philosophy, um, drills, and um, pranayama, and um, the Asana Kitchen tutorials. And um, so it'll be $11.99 per month, and it's a great way to stay inspired, and then also um, have this consistent way of absorbing the Hatha Yoga technology um, as is being offered by uh, yours truly, DG. So I uh, hope you decide to um, opt in on that and make use of it, and um, I think it's going to be an excellent resource. Greetings. Welcome to the Asana Kitchen podcast. I'm David Garig, and um, today's subject is um, the myth of the all happy, all healthy, perfect yogi. And so those of you who um, have studied with me know that this is a, a theme that I I come back to um, repeatedly, and um, this, uh, I feel that uh, yoga students are kind of misled and, um, and have a kind of mistaken idea about um, practice, a kind of fundamental mistaken idea that basically that like yoga, you do yoga to, to be happy, to kind of put a smile on your face. And, um, and like go through your whole day in um, just kind of without affliction, right? And that um, somehow that that's, that's what you're doing when you do yoga. And, and, and that... Uh, Kind of darkness or pain, um, various afflicted states are like um, well, loneliness or um, anger or um, sadness, uh, worry, anxiety, uh, fear. Um, just um, so many of these um, very basic uh, human uh, emotions and um, thought patterns and re responses that we fall into that somehow these are, they're all wrong or, or negative and that a, a good yogi eliminates these. It could cuts, just cuts them out and like through breathing techniques and asana and, and uh, mental focus, you, you kind of banish those thoughts, those types of responses or th thought processes, feelings from your psyche, and then you kind of live in the perpetual um, now, in this moment, and this moment is affliction-free. And so uh, and that's what I'm going to address today, is um, how that, yes, in a certain general way, you do yoga to, um, to feel good and to kind of clear your mind and um, make, make your day a little better, um, clear, make your body a little more strong and flexible and um, be, focus your mind and um, not be so challenged by all the various afflictions that, um, that, that can be present. And so, and that is true, but, to, but you can take that too far and and miss something very important about um, self knowledge and um, gaining wisdom and um, living according to to yoga's ideals of like um, compassion and kind of um, charity and universal love like um, and so. I'm going to start off with um, th this, I, this quote from um, 
James Hillman, the Jungian analyst that was a wonderful um, thinker and speaker and writer, and I, and what I would say, he's, he's like, um, he calls, he, it's so interesting because he, he makes a distinction in, um, that I've never come across before, which is in terms of growth or um, wisdom or self-knowledge. Um, in yoga, it's, it's always seen as this kind of ascending up the mountain to a, to a peak um, and that you're, you're always trying to attain kind of the heights of consciousness, right? And, so, and you're, you're reaching for the light, which is kind of symbolized by the sun up in the, the heavens, and you're leaving darkness behind. And, um, and so there's always this climbing kind of quality to it and an ascendancy to um, realization or enlightenment. Even the word enlightenment but James Hillman, he, he acknowledges that, um, that ascendancy, but he also gives, uh, gives credit to or um, speaks of and champions what he calls soul, which is, um, that's the valley. So, so it's going down into the um, soil, into the roots, into the darkness, and, um, and that being equally um, just as v valuable and necessary for uh, becoming a whole person as ascending. So there's, um, there's spirit on one hand, which is what you ascend to, and then there's soul on the other hand, which is what you descend into to, to get um, knowledge and to just live your life um, in a place of power and um, kind of centeredness and uh, basic loving, uh, lovingness or loving yourself, uh, being with yourself and um, being able to negotiate all the ups and downs that, of your life that um, necessarily come as you um, just walk through the, the course from uh, you know, childhood and young adulthood, mature adulthood, into old age. There's trials and tribulations. No one has a, an easy, perfect road. It's, it's a crooked path. There's many obstacles and um, challenges and uh, tr truly uh, heavy things that we all have to pass through in this life um, in order to come out the other side and have... Uh, and feel that we've lived a worthy uh, and fulfilling life. And this is what I'm saying is that it's funny how um, within the ancient texts, the, um, they can seem to be um, cutting off this soul aspect, just like even in the, the there's five um, kleshas or root causes of pain or afflictions, they're called, and um, and they're they're standard things like attachment to pleasure and egoism and um, aversion to pain and um, fear of death or clinging to life and um, and ignorance of the spiritual path is the the, the first klesha and it can seem like that yoga itself is telling you that those, those afflictions have no value in their own, like your, your ego states or your attachments or the things that, um, that you're, you have a deep aversion to or avoid that, and your fears and these things, they don't have any inherent value or they're, you're not encouraged to go exploring those and um, kind of mining them. Um, you're encouraged to, to lessen them and their effects and, and cut them off, um, create a state of nirodaha where you, a cessation of the flow of them or a cessation of identification with them. And I'm going to say that in a general way that is true, but I'm going to take it further and say that no, these are, these need to be mined. We each need to mine our, um, our afflicted states and, um, 
as a necessary and just basic part of practicing yoga. And, and then the, what's funny is the sacred texts do it, but the modern um, look or the modern um, viewpoint or presentation of yoga also really encourages it. Like um, just um, if you see on the Yoga Journal magazine cover or on Instagram, you look that there's, there's a sort of uh, the perfect p um, person is represented. Uh, uh, not there, darkness is not shown or not not even allowed or it's it's like um, it's again it's this um, reaching for excellence and um, happiness and health and um, and these things that are this is what yoga is and um, and so so there's. Um, there's and there's not many teachers that are um, encouraging you to value your afflictions, <laughs> and um, and that's partly why I'm making this p podcast. And um, so anyway, I, I'm going to give you this f um, one um, quote from James Helmuth's little passage that. Um, it comes from a book that is called uh, A Blue Fire, which is um, the blue part is the, that um, thought about soul. It's almost like um, that's your, your contrast right there, is that the soul is blue or singing the blues, whereas um, the, the spirit is fire, right? Uh, light and ascendancy. And so this book's called A Blue Fire, which is, but the, both of them are together. And um, it's a, book that's been, it's an anthology and it's edited by the uh, more, more famous um, kind of um, pop culture type of um, self-help author Thomas Moore, who he wrote like Care of the Soul. So he really identifies with this, um, but he curates this James um, Hillman and um, makes it quite accessible. But anyway, in this passage, it's, it's called The Myth, The Myth of Normalcy. Uh, and I love that already, that Right, that we're, it's like when we're doing yoga not to like uphold this myth that we're, we're normal, we're happy, we're healthy. That, um, no, that, the, yeah, so, he, so the first um, statement is saying, it just starts off so beautiful. The soul sees by means of affliction. See, the soul part of you, it actually sees by means of affliction. And so, and then it says, um, the wound and the eye are one and the same. So the, the, and that's the eye, like the eyeball or the seeing. The wound and the eye are one and the same. So from the psyche's viewpoint, um, pathology or some kind of um, distress or um, sickness or um, challenge that pathology and insight are not opposites. And um, as if we hurt because we have no insight, and when we gain insight, we shall no longer hurt. See, this is, I feel like this right here, that sums up the, the attitude people take, the people doing yoga take towards um, their pain or their, their suffering is that that it's a sign that, just like that says, we're hurting because we don't have wisdom or we don't have insight, and that when we, and when we get wisdom, then there will be no more, um, no more pain and, um, and no longer hurting. And then, then what he says after that is no, um, he calls it pathologizing. Um, so pathologizing is itself a way of seeing. And this is so hard to accept, you see, because, and you see, you understand that I'm, partly I'm so emphasized on this, is because, see, motivation in practice is always hard, right? Uh, or often, often we are challenged to get to our mat, and whenever people um, ask me questions, that's, that's one of the very first and main questions, is how can I stay inspired? How can I motivate? And partly... We, we lose motivation because we think that when we're hurting, there's no insight. And then when we stop hurting, 
there will be insight. And so we can't, we can't embrace um, coming to the mat in pain um, with our afflictions alive within us. And um, we think that somehow we've got to come to the mat um, cheerful and um, oh, super ready to practice. And, and, and this is just um, not so. And t the motivation or the inspiration to practice becomes so much more easy when you basically, you, you, your darkness and what, uh, the obstacles, the things that are holding you back, those are, um, they're just there and they're, you're going to um, work with them and uh, admit them into the, your psychic world um, at, because they are. That's, the, that's what's so um, key to this. These are, these, this is humanness that we're talking about. This isn't something um, strange or abnormal. It's just um, standard to being human. And, and it's, of course, it's good to reach for spirit and, um, and uh, try to uh, lessen our darkness and be happy. And so it's not, we're, I'm not saying that uh, spirit is not part of it. What I am saying is that it's very natural and um, essential to um, just mine our afflictions. And so that pathologizing, that's what I would call it, is mining. I have to mine my loneliness and mine my sadness and mine my anger. And rather than just trying to cut those off or like create a state of neurodaha where, where I stop and I, I'm not identified. I'm, my, I, I don't, like I'm just, my answer to anger or um, grief is sort of equanimity, a neutrality um, towards it. So I have a couple of poems and things that I want to share with you that, um, that sort of speak to this. And uh, I, what I love about these bhakti poets is that they show you what I mean by um, what, what that statement means. Uh, Patholog pathologizing or mining affliction is it, it itself a way of, of seeing. Okay, so um, like, and you can miss this if you're, if you're not careful, but um, here's a poem from Mira. Um, and re so remember, M Mira was a, a, a great devotee of Krishna. And um, when she was a little girl, she proclaimed that Krishna was her husband. And, um, and she lived that out through her, her whole life. And one of the big themes in her poems is the separation from Krishna. And, and it's, if, it's funny how you can miss it, but she, her poems are about her own afflicted state. But then she's transforming that wound into an eye so that the hurting she's feeling is actually the insight that um, delivers the poem. Okay, so here's one. Um, it says, Mira is mad with love. And it goes, oh, friends, I am mad with love and no one sees. My mattress is thorns, is nails. Right, so she's sleeping not on a soft bed that where you get your eight hours rest. No, her mattress is thorns, nails. And so the beloved spreads his bedding elsewhere. Then the beloved is Krishna. So Krishna, he spreads his bedding elsewhere. How can I sleep? Abandonment scorches my heart. See, and th there she is. She's laying, she's laying it out there for us. Abandonment scorches my heart. And, um, and, and here she is, not cutting that, but she's, she's mining it. She's actually writing it down and like creating this poem that she's going to share with um, people about it. Um, and then, so she goes, then the next line after, how can I sleep? Abandonment scorches my heart. And then only those who have felt the knife can measure the wound's deepness. 
and only the jeweler knows the nature of the lost jewel, and I have lost him. Krishna, I've lost him, Krishna. So I've lost that deep, um, sacred connection within myself. And um, anguish takes me from door to door, but no doctor answers. And then finally, Mira calls her Lord, Oh, Dark One, so that's a name for Krishna. Oh, Dark One, only you can heal this pain. So I just love that. that um, so she's, her, her practice is partly negotiating this abandonment, this separation, this um, deep anguish that only the one who's felt the knife can measure the wound's deepness. And uh, there's one more by her that I will um, I'll read again. It's the same theme. So she goes, through, she's talking to the, um, the, the cuckoo bird. Cruel cuckoo, do you suddenly remember the season only to hurt me? The, I slept in my house. At last, I slept. And then your cry, beloved, beloved. So she's just kind of saying that the her, that cuckoo that bird sound of the, whatever that warble that melody it's it's actually saying, beloved, beloved like as a lament or a searching, and then she goes salt to a wound, a saw blade cutting my heart. You perch on your branch in a high tree, singing of love, full throated. And Mira wakes, remembering. She is alone. Yeah. And so, and, and this is the thing. This is the, the fundamental uh, thing that we are. Each of us is alone. And, and when we really um, go into practice in solitude and turn inward, that aloneness becomes very apparent. And, uh, and our loneliness and, uh, and all of the feelings and um, kind of thought processes that go with that, like uh, the fear and, um, and then feeling threatened and lashing out and anger and, um, and then abandonment. And, um, and then we get angry be about being abandoned and so many, such a swirl of um, Things can happen within us that um, deserve our attention when it really comes down to it. And that, um, that it doesn't work to try to cut those off or create a state of narodaha around them. And um, I'll read you an another amazing thing from James Hillman from the book The Blue Fire that uh, is truly uh, remarkable, and what he uh, talks about is saying that um, that every human being is sort of uh, born with and lives their life with what he calls a, a basic cry, like a, a kind of a there's a certain uh, shouting out or crying out to the universe um, about. Um, that our, our, our vulnerable or forlorn state that's just inherent to uh, being alive and being conscious. And so he, he says, um, basically he says that um, there's a certain child um, in us, that an eternal child that we all carry with us throughout our life. And, um, and then they... There's, and he gives some examples of it, this basic cry, like um, that if a person gives voice to it, it, it might be, sound something like, like this. And, um, and it gives direct voice to the abandoned content. All right, so that there's this feeling like we've been plopped out into this world and basically just turned loose all on our own, and it's just uh, this one little me against uh, all this uh, a completely foreign, alien, um, and potentially hostile um, environment. 
And so, um, so here he goes. He, he gives these examples. So f for some persons, it's, the cry is, help, please help me. And, and others say, take me just as I am. Take me, all of me, without choice among my traits. No judgment, no questions asked. Or take me without my having to do something to be someone. Or another cry might be just hold me. Or don't go away. Never leave me alone. Um, and we also m might hear the content simply by saying, love me. Or we can hear, um, teach me, show me what to do, tell me how. Or carry me, keep me. Or, or the cry from the bottom may say, let me alone, all alone. Just let me be. And, um, and then he, he, I'm going to read you this whole paragraph because it's really something. Um, so he says, um, generally the basic cry speaks in the receptive voice of the infant. So where the subject is an object, a me in the hands of others, incapable of action, yet poignantly enunciating its knowledge of its subjectivity, knowing how it wishes to be handled. Its subjectivity is in, is in the crying by means of which it organizes it, it, its existence. Okay, and then a little bit later, um, it says, um, a, and the cry says how a person is unable to meet his needs himself, unable to help himself or let himself alone. Okay, and then here's the, real challenging part um, and something that everyone who practices yoga and goes into that internal state to know themselves, the, you, it, it's a necessary to come to this, um, this kind of realization and, and it can really change things in your practice when you, when you square on this. And so what James Hillman says is it is worth insisting here that the cry is never cured. You don't nirodaha it away. It's not just like you ascend to the heights of yoga and then that basic forlorn cry of the, that goes out to the universe um, goes away. So the cry is never cured. And by giving voice to the abandoned child, it is always there and must be there as an archetypal necessity. And th so, and then he says this, and this is so um, something to square on as a human being. And it, it, it's, it could be bad news, but to me, this gives you hope it, it, because you're just a human. We're just all human trying. And so it says, um, we know well that some things we can never learn cannot help, fall back to and cry from again and again. And so there are these inaccessible places where we're always exposed and afraid, where we cannot learn or cannot love and cannot help by transforming, repressing, or accepting. See, these are the wildernesses, the caves, where the abandoned child lies hidden within us. You see, in practice, we go into those caves, and we, so we have to encounter that, this, this very vulnerable child within ourselves and respond to it in this loving um, way that, um, that we have to be ready for, right? And, so, and it says that we go on regressing into these places says something fundamental about human nature. Um, we come back to an incurable psychopathology again and again through the course of life, which yet apparently does go through many changes before and after the contact with the unchanging child. And so another way to put it, um, I want to say, is that it, uh, I'm going to read you this thing from James Hillman because um, I like it. it. It has to do what he calls you, that you're, we're in psychology, but also within the yoga practice, we're building this psychic vessel of containment. 
See, that's a perfect uh, definition of mudra, of sealing in energy, a perfect vessel of, um, of psychic vessel of containment. And, and he says that's another way of speaking of soul making. Okay, and then he says this. See, this is what's key to this um, psychic vessel of containment. And it seems to require bleeding and link and leaking as its precondition, right? So you can't build the perfect vessel. It's going to leak. It's going to bleed out. And, um, and so why, why else go through that work unless we are driven by the despair of our unstoppered condition? You see, and this is so awesome, right? So you, you're coming to the mat in a partially unstoppered condition, and so if you take the attitude that you have to be perfectly stoppered, that you have to have sealed in all your energy and there's no leaking, then you're not going to get there because, you're, because there, you haven't recognized your, your humanity and you haven't admitted this whole aspect of soul to the equation of questing after spirit. And he says that a shift happens. Um, when, when you're able to admit of, um, that there's necessary leaking to, when we're trying to seal in prana. And um, he says that there's a shift, and it goes from weakness and suffering to humility and sensitivity, and from bitterness and complaint to a taste for salt and blood. And from a focus upon emotion, the emotional pain of a wound, so it's kind of its causes, its parameters, cures, um, to its imaginal depths. And, and see, to me, that's Mira, the poems that she, she went from um, focusing on, like, you know, the emotional pain, the causes, the perimeters are curing it to to mining its imaginal depths and making a poem that lives on for hundreds of years, um, inspiring people to um, quest after spirit. And um, so there's, there's another one I want, to, um, I want to read, and this is from the Baal poets um, at that um, gypsy tribe of, um, in India that kind of wander and sing songs to the divine. And, um, and on this one, this man is um, talking to his, his own heart and, his, and he's looking at his own affliction, his own inability to, um, to overcome um, challenges within himself. And, and how does he negotiate this? That's what we're uh, kind of focusing on. So he says, oh, shame on you, my shameless heart. <sighs> What now can I say? Um, you've gathered a piece of glass at the price of gold. In spite of a pair of eyes, you've missed the valuable jewels, caring only for worthless stones. So wandering blindly, you could not see that the house overflowed with the choicest rubies and diamonds and gems of fire. And so it, all of these are sort of metaphors for um, how much time we spend um, chasing superficial desires or um, letting petty um, frustrations or angers or grudges um, occupy our time, right? And we, and we keep chasing these um, unworthy pursuits to try to be happy or um, to overcome our afflictions. And, and we literally, we, we gather a piece of glass um, but we pay for that with gold. And in, we have a pair of eyes, but we miss all the valuable jewels, carrying only for the worthless stones. Um, and then he says, um, having a sickle in your waistband, <laughs> what do you search from field to field? Um, what is the use? And then finally, so it seems so, so hopeless, right? And, um, and he's really confronting the, his shortcomings and the, the darkness within himself. But then he, he switches it with his last line and he says, My heart, will you not explore for once 
the home of beauty. Yeah. Will you not explore for once the home of beauty? And then there's one more I want to share with you from um, Tulsi Das, which again, um, it's sort of, it's a, it's a tricky, like you, it, you have to read it uh, in a certain way to catch the fact that this person is, they're in a negotiation or a relationship or an expression of their affliction, of their, um, their weaknesses and their anguish. And somehow though, they're, you, they're, they're turning that wound into an eye and, um, and gaining insight from it. Okay, and so Tulsi Das, he says, um, he, he, he goes, he's kind of, sorry, one sec. This is, I think, yes, yes, yes. This is, a, he's talking to God in, in, directly in this poem. So he says, you are the pitying, I the pitiful one. You're the beneficent, I the one who begs. I am notoriously fallen, and you dash away mountains of sin. You are the father of those without fathers. And who could be more orphaned than I? See, again, that abandonment. He's, he's speaking to that, that deep sense of um, isolation and, and the the loneliness and um, challenge that comes from that. So you're the father of those without fathers, and uh, who could be more orphaned than I? No one is so downtrodden, none more than I. And you are the one who lifts the heavy weight. You are all life. I, you are all life. I am one life. You are the master, I the servant. And you are the mother and father, teacher and friend. Um, in every connection, my lot is relief, relieved. Um, we are bound by numerous ties, you and I. So choose whichever you please. Somehow, says Tulsi, oh, you who send mercy, let me find at your feet a refuge of peace. And you realize that um, you, there's m many, many different ways of giving voice to, um, to your, or mining your darkness or your pain. And actually in your asanas is one too, is one of the ways. So that, because to me, an asana is like a body, a somatic poem. And so rather than um, kind of trying to shut out our afflicted states and the fear or worries or um, the loneliness that we feel when we um, come to the mat, those can be poured into the asana in a soulful way. And, um, and it's interesting how when we don't acknowledge those kind of fundamentally challenging states and we try to ignore or override or bypass, that's when we can get ourselves in trouble and um, push too hard or fall into ego and, um, and actually hurt ourselves. So I'm going to close this podcast um, here coming up, but I have one more set of poems that I, uh, a couple of poems that I want to read to you from um, Hafiz. And I love... Um, this this one's a little bit. Um, I just like the variety and um, how creative human beings can um, can come to sort of um, that can become to um, negotiate uh, the 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 full spectrum of um, experience um, in just being human and being conscious and. Um, being able to reflect and um, know the past and future and, um, and just what is the human condition and, um, and how can we work with all that we, um, that we perceive and uh, experience and feel. And so this poem, this is from Hafiz, who's a, who's a Sufi master. And he's a real playful poet and, um, 
and he doesn't, he, he really focuses on the light a lot, but some of his poems also address this um, kind of um, darker aspect that I'm, this soul aspect that I'm talking. And so this one's called Trying to Wear Pants. And so he says, you are a royal fish trying to wear pants <laughs> in a country as foreign as land. So you're, so you're a fish that's trying to wear um, pants and you're on land instead of water. So you're very out of place, right? And then he goes, now there's a problem worth discussing, <laughs> right? That this is the state that we're in. And so, he's, so he says, your separation from God has ripened. Now, fall like a golden fruit into my hand. So he says, all your wounds from craving love exist because of heroic deeds. And you see that this is such an interesting thing. All your wounds from craving love exist because of heroic deeds. And again, that the, the whole ascending to light, uh, climbing the mountain, it's so heroic how we overcome all the challenges and break through into um, kind of perfection or victory. And, um, and, and he's saying that all the wounds from, from craving love exist because of these um, trying to be a hero. And so he goes, now trade in those medals. Trade in those medals. Drop that pursuit. Um, and he says, that courage will help this world. Um, so, wow, that courage will help this world. Um, and then it says, so one needs to love those they have yet to love, to stand near the friend. And the friend is God or um, the sacred center within yourself. And see, and this is interesting. One needs to love those they have yet to love. And I, I, he, he might be talking about people, outer people in our lives, how we can be so judgmental and there are certain types of people or um, things that we, we don't love. We, we stay away from or we just... They raise our anger rather than our um, compassion or love. But I'm also, I'm taking it to the inner places. This is exactly what I'm saying, that these wounds that we have, these, these um, eternal vulnerability that we have, the, these things that we keep returning to and um, um, wrong coping methods and um, afflicted states that just are so hard to shake. We need to love those things that we have yet to love, and then we can stand near the friend. Uh, and, then he, and then he asks the question, why be a royal fish trying to wear pants? Yeah, what are we doing? It's so unnatural to reject um, these challenging aspects to, ab about ourselves. Um, and then there's one more from Hafiz that speaks to something I, I want to um, close with here, which is, oh shoot, no, there's actually two more. And, and this, I love this poem, because it does speak to, it's not, we don't, there's no need to get carried away with embracing our afflictions, right? So that it's, it doesn't have to become a black and white thing, um, which is partly why I even made this podcast, is because there's such an emphasis on um, kind of cutting out the darkness and ascending to the light, but then we don't need to go the other way. And this poem kind of um, addresses that. And he calls, it's called The Great Expanse. And he says, just straight out, anger sinks the boat. Yeah, so that too much anger, too much um, affliction, that's, that's no good, right? That there's a, there's a rightness in... Um, in the technique of Narodaha. Yeah, so what he says is, um, anger sinks the boat. And understand that we're, we're not praising that, um, quote, drowning in his ocean. Um, no, so we're not, we're not praising that, quote, drowning in his ocean. And, but what we're trying to do is 
just cross the great expanse of each minute with all the compassion and dignity we can find. Right? That we're just trying to cross the great expanse of each minute with all the compassion and dignity we can find. So there's, so anger will sink the boat, but then just sort of, just drowning and stop, just letting go and not feeling any kind of, um, you know, anger has teeth behind it somehow. It has its own little power. And so we're not just talking about drowning, you know, and, um, but what we're, and what it amounts to between those two is just crossing the great expanse of each moment with all the compassion and dignity that, that we can find. Okay, and now the last one I'm getting to. So, the, and this one speaks about, um, what I love about it, it's, um, there is something wonderful in knowing that we, yes, we are all are negotiating our own solitary path and dealing with this um, very fundamental sense of abandonment and aloneness. Um, but at the same time, we're in this together. Like even the fact that you and me are um, negotiating our loneliness and our um, aloneness, that that, that is some, there's solidarity in that and there's something powerful. And so this one's called A Great Need and it's a Hafiz poem and he says, it's out of a great need that we are all holding hands and climbing. See, that's, I love that image, that we're all in this path of yoga, we're all holding hands and climbing. And then he says, so, and not loving is a letting go. So to not love, it's like you're letting go of that support of the hands that, um, were, that, that we're all holding each other's hands. And so not loving is to let go of that. And then he just says, listen, the terrain around here is far too dangerous for that. <laughs> right? Far too dangerous to just let go um, and and not um, gain that support. So this let me read it for, through all the way through for you. It's a wonderful poem. It says, Our, Out of a great need, we're all holding hands and climbing. Not loving is, is a letting go. <laughs> Listen, the terrain around here is far too dangerous for that. <laughs> uh, I love that. So, so anyway... Just remember, you don't have to be the perfect, all healthy, all happy yogi, right? That we're all, um, actually, I'm sorry, I do have one more poem that speaks to that. I love this one from Kabir. And what he says is, um, the guest is inside you and also inside me. And you know the sprout is hidden inside the seed. And then this line, we're all struggling. None of us has gone far. You see, that's the thing. Every, all those people on Instagram that seem to be, have it so together, and um, the all, all of us, we're all struggling. The yoga teachers, the students, right? We're all struggling. None of us has gone far. So. Let your arrogance go and look around inside. Yeah, look around inside. The, the blue sky opens out farther and farther. The daily sense of failure goes away. The damage I have done to myself fades. A million suns come forward with light when I sit firmly in that world. So in closing, I uh, just want to again remind you about this um, new offering that I have coming, the Asana Kitchen subscription channel. So $11.99 per month, you get uh, a new video per week, in, including such things as short form practices, uh, pranayama, uh, asana tutorials, and um, 
philosophy. And then also there will be some kind of spontaneous or um, more like um, monthly offerings, uh, live Q&A or possibly live um, short form sessions. And, um, and then there's also like a, uh, a chat part to the, um, on the, where you go to get the videos that um, I hope to make a little forum and um, just stay in touch with you all and um, kind of add to the, this sort of online community that I've uh, been cultivating for um, so many years. It's a new dimension and um, I was really excited about it.